Introducing a completely redesigned experience that you can sense. And that senses you. The new Dell Latitude laptops bring your work closer to you. This is Nine News First at Five with Eliza Rugg. Good afternoon. A female pedestrian has been killed after she was struck by two cars while crossing a busy Melbourne road last night. This CCTV shows the moment before the 29-year-old woman was hit as she dodged traffic on Stud Road in Dandenong around 9 o'clock. The driver of the first car stopped to assist, but the second vehicle drove off, leaving the injured woman to die at the scene. After she was struck, she was thrown onto the lanes on the opposite direction and a second car has struck the pedestrian when she was lying on the road. Police are now hunting for the driver of the second vehicle. It's described as a small dark coloured SUV. The man accused of raping a woman in the back of an Uber vehicle in Melbourne has been ordered to remain behind bars after making a failed bid to be released on bail. Reid Butler reports. Well, this is the corner in Melbourne CBD where police say a 19-year-old woman was picked up by a 44-year-old Uber driver who would then allegedly rape her in the back seat of his car. Burmese refugee Mohammed Yaya is the man accused, a father of one. His wife and child live in the Philippines. He's now been refused bail and we've learned harrowing details about the allegations. Police say the woman had just left a nightclub when Yaya pulled up and offered her a ride in his Uber vehicle. The court heard the driver, who has also been charged with false imprisonment, showed his young passenger condoms and said, do you mind, it won't take long, I always finish really fast. During the journey, the woman texted her friend saying, help please, sparking a flurry of calls that went unanswered. Police say the rape occurred in the back seat at nearby Batman Street in West Melbourne, and that's where he left her, they say, refusing to drive any further. The magistrate last night said that Mohammed Yahya did pose a risk to the community. He was ordered to remain behind bars. The woman is said to be traumatised. The driver's Uber account has been suspended. A 29-year-old man has been extradited from Melbourne to Sydney to face kidnapping and sexual assault charges. Police allege Yang Yu Miu was among a group of people who lured a 36-year-old woman to an address in Sydney's north to sell illegal tobacco. The group then allegedly drove the woman to another address in nearby Eastwood. She was blindfolded, she was bound and she was gagged. The victim was subjected to being injected with a prohibited drug remained gagged and bound, stripped naked, sexually assaulted. The drug that was used was enough to almost render the victim unconscious. The group later attempted to extort $300,000 from the woman. The photographs taken of that victim, she was then threatened that uh, if she didn't pay a sum of ransom that uh, those photographs would be released. Another man has been arrested in Melbourne on unrelated matters. Police will allege he led the sexual assault on the woman. They are also looking for two others, an Asian woman and a man of Caucasian or Middle Eastern appearance. While the rain in Sydney has stopped, residents in the city's northwest have been cut off, with major flood warnings and evacuation orders still in place. Alex Heinke has the latest. Now, don't let the blue skies fool you because there is still serious flooding occurring in areas around Sydney on the Hawkesbury and the Pean Rivers. We're on board with the SES, checking cut-off communities and doing supply drops to those who need it. They are on standby for any medical emergency because several ferries have been halted due to the rising floodwaters. Now, overnight, the rain continued to fall, but the outlook is clear, which is the good news. Minimal to no rain expected today and tomorrow across this region. The fact of the matter is... Our dams are full, our waterways are full, our grounds are saturated. So the impact of the rain that we're having at any given time is having a much more profound effect. And as a result of that, we've invoked a number of warnings, uh, evacuation warnings. Most of New South Wales, you will see only limited amounts of rainfall. But that does not mean that the risk is not there because what we are going to see now is riverine flooding in many areas, particularly in the west of Sydney. Now, for residents in these flood-affected areas, they are certainly not out of the 
the woods just yet. Warragamba Dam and several other actually smaller dams are continuing to spill, so they remain on high alert across the course of today and into tomorrow. Opposition leader Peter Dutton has vowed to ditch Labor's 2030 climate target, igniting a new battle over Australia's energy plans. Federal politics reporter Eliza Edwards has the details. The Albanese government currently has a target of cutting carbon emissions by 43% before the end of this decade through massive investments in renewable energy and using gas as a transition fuel. It's a legally binding target that Peter Dutton now says he will rip up. He's aiming to reach net zero by 2050 by allowing nuclear power to do the heavy lifting, but power stations wouldn't be up and running until closer to the mid-century deadline. The only way that Australia will achieve net zero is with nuclear energy in the mix. The Coalition is refusing to nominate an alternative pollution cutting goal and won't confirm if they're walking away from interim targets altogether. If they do, it threatens Australia's membership of an international climate pact which could leave us isolated on the world stage. Not being in the Paris Accord would mean that Australia becomes an international pariah and an investment wasteland. We need to slash climate pollution now. Later is too late. The Paris Agreement commits nations to contributing to action to limit warming under two degrees to avoid the worst damage from global warming. Scientists say reaching net zero isn't enough and deep reductions in the short term are critical. Scammers are using a loophole to steal money from unsuspecting public transport users in Victoria. At least 14 people have had their money taken off their unregistered Mikey cards due to a flaw in the system. The real concern here is that if scammers have found a way to hack these cards, that the 14 that the, uh, the government knows about is just a drop in the ocean. The state government says those affected by the scam will have their money refunded. Public transport users are encouraged to register their cards to avoid a similar scenario. Melbourne researchers are on the cusp of developing a concussion blood test that could indicate when it's safe for an injured player to return to sport. Emily Rice explains. Right now, there's no definitive tool to assess how a player's brain is recovering after a sport concussion. Following a head blow, athletes, their club and doctors rely on concussion symptoms to determine how much time they spend on the bench. This protocol can be considered or treated like a one-size-fits-all approach. Now, doctors Stuart McDonald and William O'Brien from Monash University are a step closer to developing a blood test to track the effect of sport-related concussion on the brain and better determine when it's safe to return to play. Using a blood test such as this provides an avenue to measure how the brain is actually recovering. The Monash University test measures two proteins which are released from the brain into the blood following a head injury. We found that these proteins were elevated in most athletes with concussion but the most striking finding was that about 20% of the athletes had levels that were elevated for over four weeks. The researchers also found that even when obvious concussion symptoms have resolved and players feel like they're okay, the brain itself may not yet have fully recovered. Researchers are hoping to have the concussion test refined and approved for use outside the lab in the coming years. Still to come in the news ahead this afternoon, US President Joe Biden warns of the need to defend democracy during a D-Day speech. And new security footage offers a clue in the search for TV doctor Michael Mosley. And some aspiring judo champions meet their Olympic heroes at the national championships. While speaking at the site of a key D-Day battle, US President Joe Biden paid tribute to soldiers and issued a plea to Americans at home. More from US correspondent Jonathan Kersley. Joe Biden stood atop Point du Hoc above the cliff scaled by American soldiers 80 years ago to fight Nazi Germany on D-Day. America's commander-in-chief drew comparisons between that fight and the one to stop Russia in Ukraine, suggesting D-Day heroes would want America and its allies to stand up to Putin's aggression. 
He also met Vladimir Zelensky apologizing for a delay in U.S. military assistance to Ukraine, blaming U.S. Congress. America has also allowed its weapons to be used by Ukraine inside Russia's borders. Russia's President Vladimir Putin has said that allows Russia to arm enemies of the West if it so chooses. That was met with applause. Joe Biden's speech was all framed around a fight for democracy. It was delivered 40 years after Ronald Reagan's address in the same place. In 1984, Everyone President Reagan spoke of the U.S. fight against tyrannical governments during World War II. It was delivered at a time the U.S. was involved in the final years of the Cold War struggle with the Soviet Union. Yeah. Joe Biden, in part, drew on Ronald Reagan's message to deliver one of his own today. He urged Americans to stand up for American values. They're not asking us to scale these cliffs, but they're asking us to stay true to what America stands for. They're asking us to do our job to protect freedom in our time, to defend democracy. This was also a speech intended to be heard by US voters ahead of November's presidential election. Joe Biden didn't mention Donald Trump directly by name, but he did warn of the need to fight aggression abroad and at home. Former Apollo 8 astronaut and retired Major General William Anders has been killed in a light plane crash in the US. The 90-year-old pilot was the sole person on board when the aircraft went down off the coast of Washington State. During his NASA career, he was renowned for taking the historic Earthrise photograph during the 1968 mission to the moon. The search for missing British television presenter Michael Mosley has entered a fourth day on the Greek island of Simi. New security footage appears to show the 67-year-old walking through a village about 20 minutes after he left his home for an afternoon walk. Drones, helicopters, divers and sniffer dogs have all been deployed in the large-scale investigation. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has been forced to apologise after leaving a key D-Day event early. His political opponents slammed the PM for heading back from France to attend a pre-recorded election campaign interview with broadcaster ITV. Foreign Minister David Cameron represented the UK alongside leaders of the US, France, Germany and Ukraine. Aspiring judo athletes have had the chance to hone their skills while taking on our Olympic champions on the Gold Coast. Yasmin Bonnell has the story. I'm here at Carrara where Australia's national judo championships are currently underway and on hand to watch them is the current Olympian Katerina Hacker. Katerina, why are you here today? What's today all about? Um, I'm like here to watch the kids. Um, it's great to be here and see them enjoying judo and fighting each other. And Paris is obviously just weeks away. How are you feeling about that? Um, nervous, but super excited at the same time. I think I'm more excited than nervous. i um, ready to go, so, so keen to go over there and show, show my best. <laughs> Absolutely. And I know Australia's only ever bought home bronze from the Olympics. What are you hoping to bring home this year? Uh, of course, hoping for a gold medal, becoming an Olympic champion, like childhood dream. Uh, I think in the end I would settle for any medal, but um, overall, like, I, I really want to win. And I guess uh, here today we could be seeing some of our future stars. Yeah, it's really exciting looking at them, seeing like how like how much they enjoy the sport, how passionate they are, um, and so like skillful as well. Um, it's great to see them, and maybe we're going to see them in Brisbane. <laughs> The national championships are on here until Monday. Now with a look ahead to today's sport, here's Nat Yanidis. Thanks, Eliza. Well, coming up after the break, the Hawks daring to dream after another clutch win. Those highlights coming up next. More headaches for Pies coach Craig McRae as a star midfielder undergoes surgery. Adriel Mitchell does his best to earn an origin recall. And history for Spain's Carlos Alcaraz at Roland Garros. Tipping Point has changed lives, but never like this. You could be playing for 120,000. The must-see Tipping Point event. This has never happened here before. Monday at 5 on 9. Incredibly fun, remarkably functional, and effortlessly stylish. Introducing the all-new Ford Puma. A compact SUV that really packs a punch. Looking good has never been this easy. Secure yours today. The all-new Ford Puma.
effortlessly stylish. Welcome back. Hawthorne has continued its resurgence with a one-goal win over the Giants in Tassie. The lead kept changing in the last quarter until it came down to a Luke Bruce free kick from the pocket. Sucks in the oxygen. An incredible win. The Hawks have now won six of their past eight matches. Collingwood will be without Premiership midfielder Tom Mitchell for the next six to eight weeks. Mitchell was a no-show at Pies training this morning after having foot surgery. Meanwhile, the Lions hosted a family day in Melbourne following their 43-point thumping of the Bulldogs. Eric Hip would start with a career-high six goals. I feel really, really good um, after a great result like that. Um, I think the thing that makes us feel so good is that it was a great team performance. Um, there was no passengers last night, which was great. The win moves Brisbane to within two games of the top eight. Latrell Mitchell has reminded Blues origin coach Michael Maguire of his talent starring as the Rabbitohs defeated the Titans 46-12. to Mitchell is away and running. Run, rabbit, run. Meanwhile, Benji Marshall has threatened to swing the axe after the Tigers fell to their ninth straight loss, thrashed 56-14 by the Dragons. And in tennis, Carlos Alcaraz is through to his first Roland Garros final. The Spaniard came from a set down to beat Yannick Sinner in five. More history for Carlos Alcaraz. He's into the final of Roland Garros for the first time. Alcaraz will face German Alexander Zverev in the final. Eliza, he is a joy to watch at the moment. Isn't he, Nat? Thank you so much. Tomorrow's forecast is next, but first, here's a look at what's coming up in Nine News at Six. Thanks, Eliza. Long weekend tragedy. A female pedestrian left for dead by a hit-run driver in Dandenong. Unregistered cards, the target of Mikey scammers. A new twist in the search for missing TV doctor Michael Mosley. Monash scientists developing a blood test for concussion. The bombers get around a young footballer bullied by online trolls. And snow, a no-show at the start of the season. Nine News is your news. This weather report brought to you by Chemist Warehouse. Get discounted prescriptions every day. Head in store or online to see how much you will save. Switch on a Dakin Alira X split system with advanced streamer technology to remove more than 99% of harmful indoor air pollutants and surround yourself with cleaner air this summer. Dakin, perfecting the air. To the weather details now, and as we heard earlier, parts of New South Wales are still at risk of major flooding. While on the opposite side of the country, a cold front will arrive in southwest WA tomorrow, bringing showers and gusty winds. Up to 10 millimetres in Perth, along with gale force winds and a top of 21 degrees. A cloudy top of 18 on the way for Adelaide tomorrow. There'll be a few showers in Melbourne, up to 4 millimetres and a top of 14. Hobart will be partly cloudy, with a shower or two, heading for 12 degrees. Sunny breaks in Sydney tomorrow with light winds and a top of 19. Brisbane can also expect blue skies heading for 23. A low of 3 degrees in Canberra with the chance of morning fog before a partly cloudy top of 13. And looking to the top end, sunny skies in Darwin tomorrow and a top of 30 degrees. Well, that is Nine News this afternoon. Our next bulletin is coming up at 6 o'clock. Thanks for your company. Bye for now.